I know the biggest question on y'all's minds is how in the world did I end up in Birmingham, Alabama? Well, you're here because of two corporals. And now doing my best Paul Harvey, I'm going to give you why you're here and all about the two corporals. Okay? Mm -hmm. Up until World War II, there was nothing in this country, training-wise, for adult blind individuals. We had schools for children, but we had nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, for adults. So when hundreds of young men came back from World War I, blinded due to the type of combat that they had, the government didn't know what to do with them. So they farmed them out to various associations for the blind. And it wasn't a real nice future making mops and brooms and caning furniture. And thankfully, we didn't make the same mistake after World War II. Now, the whole thing about blind rehabilitation for adults, believe it or not, centers on the long cane. And we're not exactly sure where the original idea of the long cane comes from. But if you look back into history, you'll notice that individuals who were visually impaired back, say, in the Dark Ages and, and before then, always tried to blend in. Because to not blend in during that time of huge religious fervor was to be treated very, very differently. We still have some of that today, just not to the extent. Because if you had a disability during the Dark Ages, everybody figured it was because you had really made God angry. And if you'd made God angry, then you needed to be dealt with here, too. And how they dealt with you primarily was to burn you at the stake. Because if you'd made God angry, you were obviously in league with Satan. Even if your disability came from birth, and you had nothing to do with it, God was mad at you. Well, obviously we know a little bit better than that today. But back then, it was a very serious business. Now, people traveled very differently back in the Dark Ages. There were no automobiles. Very few people could afford a horse. Most people didn't have a cart. Most people walked. And the nature of society was that you might have a small town here, and then a mile or two through the woods, you might have a clearing where you'd had a little burg, and then a couple more miles through the woods, you might have a little village, and then a few more miles through the woods, you might have what we would call a small city. The thing is, you had to walk. And back then, just like today, there were people in the woods that made their living taking from other people. They had bandits. And the favorite weapon of the bandits was a little six or eight inch knife. Well, people found out very quickly that a good 10 to 12 long foot piece of wood trumped a six inch knife. <laughs> so most people travel with what we would today call a long staff. Well, visually impaired people, again, weren't stupid. They understood that as you had to walk someplace, everybody carried a staff. So they did too. Primarily to blend in. To look like everybody else. And undoubtedly, there were individuals who worked out some kind of method for moving that staff in front of them to keep themselves from running into buildings, trees, creeks, <laughs> and things like that. Because human beings are known to be very, very adaptive and very smart. Well, nothing changed for three or four hundred years. And the first real public conscious of the fact that a blind person might carry an extra long piece of wood, a staff, or a long stick, actually came in 1750. There was a man in England named John Metcalf. He was a road builder. He was a road builder with an eye disease, and he was losing his eyesight very, very rapidly. And in 1750, there was no Social Security in England. There was no retirement system. You either fended for yourself, or you relied upon the largesse of family and friends. But Mr. Metcalf had neither. He was not necessarily a pleasant man, didn't make friends easily, drove his workers extremely hard, and I think his family had disowned him by the time he started losing his vision. So he only had one real option, that was continue to work. Well, 
The London Times, which was one of the first newspapers ever, heard about Mr. Metcalf. It seemed that Mr. Metcalf continued to build roads using a 22-foot long piece of wood moving out in front of him to test the ground and also to keep himself from falling into the boggy parts. And what was probably the very first human interest story, there on page one they had a picture, i.e. a lithograph, carved from a wooden block, of John Metcalf and his long 22-foot long piece of wood. And all of a sudden, society started thinking in terms of having blind people using long pieces of wood to help get around. But still not a whole lot was done. There were no schools established for adults. There was no training established for adults. Everybody felt that blind people could pretty much do better if they were left alone. And then World War I happened. Now, World War I was unlike any other conflict ever. The use of the machine gun, the tank, and chemical warfare, i.e. mustard gas, blinded thousands of young men on both sides of the conflict. When the Doughboys came home to America, there was no VA yet. The federal government did not know what to do with them. And so again, they paid various associations for the blind to teach these men how to make mops and brooms. Not the future that these young men had in mind when they went off to war. In Germany, it was worse. Because Germany had started the war, the Allies really stuck it to them. The Treaty of Versailles took just about everything away from Germany. They were bankrupt. And they had a unique problem in Germany. During the trench warfare, the German army had used hundreds of German shepherds as alert or guard dogs so that when the Allies came across no man land, no man's land, or when the gas attacks came, the dogs would provide a warning for the German troops. Well, the German army, being bankrupted, could no longer afford to maintain the dogs. But we can always say one nice thing about the Germans. They are one of the most organized peoples in the history of this planet. And what they ended up doing is putting a doctor in charge of those dogs. Of course, at first he had no idea what to do with them. And one day while he was contemplating his problem, he saw one of the blinded German soldiers trying to make his way across a courtyard. And of course the soldier ran into everything. Benches, trees, planters. His heart went out to him. So he went outside and found the man and just blurted out, would you like a dog? Well, the man said, sure, nobody here is talking to me. That would be kind of nice. The doctor got him a dog. The very next day, the doctor saw the dog guiding him, that blinded soldier, around all the obstacles he'd run into the day before. And the big light bulb went on above his head. Why couldn't he take all of these guard dogs, add some additional training, and pair them with the blinded German soldiers so that they could move about safely in society? These were the first guide dogs. And it took off in Germany. Well, over here in America, it was the Roaring Twenties. And if you had a disability of any kind, you really kept to yourself because you were shunned otherwise. The war to end all wars was over. It was time for America to party, and America partied. But there was one young woman in Nashville, Tennessee, named Dorothy Harrison Eustace. Her profession was to train dogs. She had a little training and obedience school called Fortunate Fields. She trained guard dogs and search and rescue dogs and police dogs, and is what we would consider today as cutting edge. Anyway, through a trade journal, she found out what was going on in Germany. And she paid her own fare over to Germany to watch. She was convinced she could do it better. 
So she found a volunteer in Nashville, a man named Morris Frank. She took six dogs and they went to Switzerland. They didn't want to be in the public eye here because, again, it was the Roaring Twenties. She trained all six dogs and Mr. Frank with all six dogs. It was very successful. And they came back home and they wrote an article that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, the American magazine that had the most circulation in this country. And we don't know who the copywriter was or the editor or whoever wrote the headline, but he wrote something that said, Seeing Eye Dog Helps Blind Man. Well, millions of Americans read that. And Miss Eustace was inundated with phone calls, letters, and telegrams trying to get a seeing eye dog for everybody in America who was blind. Well, she couldn't handle it. She had a tiny little center, tiny little school. She couldn't handle all the requests. And one day she got a phone call from a very wealthy New Jersey businessman. He said, I understand you're being overwhelmed by requests for these seeing eye dogs. I'd like to help out. I have all kinds of land up here. I have all kinds of money I don't know what to do with. It was the Roaring Twenties. And he goes, I'll build you a school and anything else you want as long as my nephew is one of those first people you train. <laughs> and she said, yes. You've heard of the school. It's called the Seeing Eye. And it is still one of the most internationally renowned guide dog schools. It is a wonderful place. They do wonderful work. And they have always been at the forefront of training people with guide dogs. Do a wonderful job. Wonderful job. Well, as this was getting going, the depression hits. And people weren't thinking about necessarily doing anything extra. They were hoping to eat today or keep a roof over their head. And it wasn't only individuals who were in trouble. It was states, too. The state of Illinois lost a ton of money in the market. So much so that they tried to find ways to save money. They had a beautiful school for the blind out in the country. Kids had tens, hundreds of acres to roam in. They sold it and moved all those blind kids to a warehouse in downtown Peoria, Illinois. Well, you can imagine having all that land to run and play on, being reduced to a courtyard no bigger than one of our floors here at the center, boded trouble. And the kids spilled out into the streets of Peoria, where they got in the way of the motorists, and the motorists got in the way of the kids, and there were some probably verbal exchanges that we won't relate here. But you can well imagine all of the problems. Well, the Lions Club of Peoria decided to do something about it. They took those wooden support canes that everybody had in those days. They painted them white. They got the city council of Peoria to pass a city ordinance. Very simply said, any child carrying a white cane has the right of way. And they took those canes to the school for the blind. Well, each kid took a cane, wandered out in the street, they publicized the ordinance, and the problems ceased to exist. Motorists would see the kids with the canes and they would come to a complete stop. Kids were able to cross the street very safely, very efficiently, and oh my God, it worked. That little city ordinance became the basis for every white cane law in this country. And every state in this country has a white cane law. And very simply, it states, any individual carrying a white cane, whether it be a long white cane or a support cane, has the right of way. Period. Bill and I have jobs because most motorists fail to recognize that law. We have to make our students aware of the idiotic things that motorists do. But that law exists in every state in this country. Well, this was a neat first step. As that city ordinance became a state law and spread throughout the country, more people were starting to become aware of the fact that blind people did not necessarily need to stay at home, unlike before. 
And then World War II happened. And again, thousands of young men on our side of the conflict started losing their sight due to their service. Well, the guys that lost their sight fighting in Europe went to Valley Forge Hospital. That's where the two corporals were. It only took me half an hour to get back to the corporals, okay? The guys that lost their sight fighting in the Pacific went to Dibble Army Hospital in California. And the two places couldn't have been much different. At Valley Forge, the two corporals were named Warren Bledsoe and Richard Hoover. Richard Hoover was an aspiring ophthalmologist. He was in medical school when the Army called. And because of his specialty in eyes, they stuck him in the blind ward. Warren Bledsoe was a teacher and administrator at the Maryland School for the Blind. So Army intelligence being what it is, they shipped him to the blind ward as well. Now the blind ward at Valley Forge was nothing more than a huge Quonset hut where the soldiers came in and they were given a cot, a bedpan, and one of those little white canes. And nothing else was being done. Because nobody knew what else to do. It was up to the two corporals. And as they talked, they decided that probably the biggest problem these soldiers were having was being able to get from point A to point B. <laughs> Safely. Because those little support canes didn't do anything for them. So all Richard Hoover did was invent the long cane and the method for using it. Warren Bledsoe, who had a lot of experience in the field, became a very enthusiastic supporter. And as they started working with the soldiers there at Valley Forge, they found one thing to be true. Not everybody wanted to be identified as visually impaired. And so there was resistance from the troops. Until one day, one of the soldiers that had picked up a white cane and had tried it missed lunch. And then he missed supper. He barely made it back for bed call or bed check. These guys were still on active duty. They had rules to follow. When he walked back into the Quonset hut three minutes before curfew, everybody wanted to know where in God's name he had been. And he had a tale to tell. He had taken his cane and as a lark decided to see what he could find on the hospital property. And he'd found the front gate of the hospital. Well, he'd ventured outside the front gate and the first thing he noticed outside the front gate was that just to the left was a tavern. And he'd spent the entire... And when he promised those guys that he would teach them how to get to the tavern if they took up the long cane... Everybody then volunteered for cane training the next day. And that's how history is made. <laughs> because all the soldiers there on the blind ward volunteered for cane training because it was going to lead them to the promised land, i.e. a cold beer. <laughs> well, things were going so well at Valley Forge that Hoover and Bledsoe decided to share it. So Bledsoe took a trip out to the West Coast. He went to Dibble, and he took some canes, and he ran smack dab into a staff out at Dibble Army Hospital that wanted absolutely nothing to do with what was going on back east. They were trying to teach soldiers something they called facial vision. It was thought that little tiny receptors in your chin, your nose, your forehead, and your cheeks opened up and allowed you to see when your two good eyes could no longer do it for you. Anyway, at Dibble, they're teaching this skill that they didn't understand, a listening skill, called obstacle perception. What obstacle perception is, is that you can tell a difference in the sound as you approach an object with your footfalls. What the staff did not take into account is that you have to have almost perfect hearing to be successful at this. It's a very difficult skill to master. Well, they're working with combat veterans. And as you guys know, combat is loud. And in World War II, they knew nothing about protecting people's hearing. So these soldiers out at Dibble couldn't hear very well. So they're having absolutely no success 
with this obstacle perception or facial vision method that they were being taught. Many of them showed an interest in the long cane. And Mr. Bledsoe was able to demonstrate the long cane to them in private. And they were very interested after seeing how it worked. But then Warren Bledsoe was pretty much kicked out of Dibble. And as he crossed back across the country, at first he got very angry. And then he had an epiphany. His epiphany was this. The VA, which was now around during World War II, needed to have a blind rehab center so that soldiers who were lost their sight during the wars could come in and learn how to travel independently. Plus, he thought that he, this place ought to have all this other added instruction that they had at the schools for the blind. The ADLs, the communications, the manual skills. His idea was to put all this under one roof under the auspices of the VA. So he didn't bother to get off the train in Philadelphia. He went down to Washington, D.C. Walked into the chief of the VA's office and was promptly thrown out on his ear. Because the guy running the VA during World War II only wanted to do one thing, and that was retire. So he goes back to Philadelphia and he bides his time. About a year and a half later, the war ends. And who took over the reins at the VA? A man you've heard of named Omar Bradley. And what was Bradley's big motto? Anything for the common soldier. Bradley was one of the few generals around that understood that it was the soldier up front that won the war. His job as the general was to keep him supplied with clothing and food and ammunition. But the soldier was everything. The general was not that important. Well, now, before he was going to retire, he decided to give the VA two years. And when Bledsoe heard that he had started, he went right back to D.C. unannounced and walked into Bradley's office, only to find that he was gone for the day. Instead, he talked to General Bradley's top aide, a man named General Hawley. And to his credit, General Hawley listened for two hours about Bledsoe's idea of having a National Blind Rehab Center, why it was needed, what it would entail, and where they could put it. And Hawley loved the idea. And he knew Bradley would like the idea too. So he told Warren Bledsoe, General Bradley's schedule tomorrow morning starts at 8 and he's full till 6 o'clock. But he's always in by 6 a.m. Bledsoe took the hint. He was there at 6 a.m. the next morning. General Hawley got him in to see General Bradley. Bradley loved the idea. Even though it had never been floated before, he thought having a National Blind Rehab Center for those soldiers who lost their vision in service to their country was a great idea. He turned to General Hawley. He goes, I want you to make this happen. No committees, no research groups. Make this happen. General Hawley goes to his office, picks up the phone, calls a friend of his, a guy named Dr. Kelso, who just happened to run the Heinz VA in Chicago, Illinois. And he said, congratulations! You're going to be the home of the first comprehensive blind rehabilitation program the world has ever seen. Oh, and by the way, keep your hands off of it. So General Hawley sends Warren Bledsoe, Richard Hoover, and remember that soldier that found the beer? His name was Russ Williams. He was from Gary, Indiana. And they had asked Russ, since he was one of the first true believers in the cane, to be the director of the Flying Rehab Center. Those three gentlemen go to Chicago, and they steal every physical therapist, corrective therapist, and occupational therapist Heinz had. They were given carte blanche, and they took 36 men, and they turned them all into orientation and mobility instructors. Heinz opened its doors July 4th, 1948. And the first class of 13 veterans walked in the door. And the first thing that they did at Heinz was to blindfold all of them. Whether they had any vision left or not, they blindfolded them. And for the next six months, 
these 13 veterans learned all there was to learn about how to deal and cope with blindness. Mm -hmm. The majority of the training had to do with manual skills and orientation and mobility. And they learned how to get around in Chicago. Well, you can imagine over six months, these guys either hated each other or they got really tight. And it was the latter. They got really tight. And as they were discussing how they could spread the word, they decided to all become members of the Blinded Veterans Association and become advocates to go back to their home states, to meet with veterans groups, to tell the world that this program existed and that it would actually help blinded veterans. And that's what they did. And the waiting list at Heinz got longer and longer and longer. When the Korean War broke out, the waiting list was three years long. Wow. That's in four years. Mm -hmm. Well, it got worse. Guys were having to wait four years, five years to get in. Mm -hmm. Kind of like today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, only the BVA decided to do something about it. They decided they needed more centers. So they went to Congress in the late 1950s and they said, we need two more blind rehab centers. And Congress at that time was actually full of real leaders, i.e. veterans. Guys who had walked the walk in World War II and in Korea. And they got the proposal and they said, sure. And they created two more blind rehab centers, one in West Haven, Connecticut, one in Palo Alto, California. But now they needed somebody to run all three. So they took Russ Williams, who was the director at Heinz, and kicked him upstairs and brought him into Washington as the director of blind rehab services. His successor at Heinz was a man from North Carolina, believe it or not, named Gene Apple. Have you met Gene? No. You need to meet Gene. Gene became the second director at Heinz and the first director at Palo Alto. Now, being a North Carolina boy, he understood that Chicago winners were not to be trifled with. <laughs> and if he could go to California, he was going to California. And it's a good thing that he did. Gene lost his sight during World War II to a grenade. And yet, he had more insight than most people in this country. He gets out to California, and he runs into hundreds of World War I veterans. Guys who lost their sight not while they were in service, but after their service. And they wondered if anything could be done for them. So Gene calls his buddies back up in the BVA and says, we need to make this these centers work for non-service connected veterans. The BVA goes back to Congress. Again, Congress is still full of veterans. They okay it so that the blind rehabilitation centers and service are the very first service in VA history to welcome non-service connected veterans in the doors. But it doesn't end there. At Heinz, they were still blindfolding everybody who walked in the door. But Gene noticed that a lot of his non-service connected veterans had usable vision. And he thought, why don't we teach them how to use that vision more efficiently, more appropriately? So he gets together with the San Francisco School of Optometry, and together they create the field of low vision. So if nothing else, you are in the top rung of the low vision centers veterans. And it has been spread throughout the entire planet thanks to the VA, especially thanks to Gene Apple. Okay? Well, this was great. And for about 15 to 18 years, things worked. Except then, as the Korean veterans and the Vietnam veterans started to have eye problems, the waiting lists again started to get longer and longer. Southern veterans finally found their voice. They didn't want to go to Chicago or Connecticut in December or January or February. So the BVA went back to Congress and the fourth blind rehab center, 
This one in Birmingham, Alabama, opened its doors November 22, 1982. A fifth blind rehab center opened its doors 10 years later in Tucson, Arizona. But that's not all about the system. There are five blind rehab centers, and I call them centers simply because they can work with 25 veterans to 32 veterans at a given time. They're large. But there are eight smaller programs that I've always called clinics that can work with anywhere from 8 to 15 veterans at a time teaching the same subjects, giving out the same information to blinded veterans. And they're scattered all over the country. The closest ones to here are Augusta, Georgia, West Palm Beach, Florida, and Biloxi, Mississippi is the newest. It's your program. While you are here, make sure you get the information you want to get. Ask questions. It's your program. No question is dumb. No question is too complicated. And there is no request that cannot be filled by this center. It does not mean that the request can be filled right away, thanks to the red tape and all the bureaucracy that the VA entails. But we can get it done, because it is one of the very few services inside the Veterans Administration that still puts the veterans first. And it's all because of two corporals. Richard Hoover went on to become an ophthalmologist. After his service to this country and service at Valley Forge, he finished medical school, became a first-rate ophthalmologist. And I think when I was in school, I might have been one of the last groups to actually got lucky enough to meet the man, which is where I'm getting a lot of this information. Okay? Where was he? He, was, he came to Kalamazoo, Michigan, mm -hmm. and held a little class for us, and we got to ask any question under the sun, and we did. <laughs> Mostly about mobility, not about eye diseases. Mm -hmm. Warren Bledsoe, believe it or not, became the second director of blind rehab services. He was so dedicated to his blinded veterans that he ruffled so many feathers in D.C. that they fired him. Mm -hmm. The third director of blind rehab services promptly hired him back as a consultant. Mm -hmm. And he spent the remainder of his life working for visually impaired and blinded veterans. Their ideas, especially Bledsoe's, was to make sure that these programs would be here for you, no matter what. He did a remarkable job with that. We try to live up to what he's done. So again, remember that this is your program. And it is a program you can utilize more than once with many VA benefits being one and done, this is not one of them. If you have a life-changing experience, or your life does change even a little bit after you leave this program, you move from the city to the country, or the country to the city, or you experience a little bit more vision loss, or whatever it might be, new technology comes out that you want to get involved in, this center will be here for you. You can come back. We've had one young man from Atlanta, Georgia, has been here 11 times. Wow. Each time it was legitimate. And each time he gained something by coming back. We're here for you. It's your program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? It's a wealth of knowledge. Yep. It it's is a wealth of knowledge. Very interesting. A This has been the unofficial official history of orientation and mobility. Robert Bob Simpson grew up in Caramel, Indiana, a suburb of Indianapolis. When he graduated high school, he became a successful DJ. Have a question about real rock and roll? Bob is your man. Bob received his master's in orientation and mobility at Western Michigan University, where he met Richard Hoover, one of the two World War II Army corporals that started the field of O&M. Graduating from Western Michigan, Bob went to the Heinz Veterans Affairs Blind Center to do his internship where Warren Bledsoe taught Bob the unofficial history of how the field came to be, which is how Bob came up with the idea of the unofficial official history of O&M, a lecture he has given every month for the past 32 years. Bob worked at the Northampton 
Southern VA for 11 months before coming to the Southeastern Blind Rehabilitation during the Christmas of 1982. Bob left the SBRC for one year in 1995 as one of the first blind rehabilitation outpatient specialists for the Department of Veterans Affairs in Indianapolis, Indiana. Bob of course returned and has been a cornerstone of this center. Now that Bob is retiring no one will be able to tell the history quite like him so we needed him to create this video before he left. We wish you the best in retirement Bob. From Bill, Catherine, Chris, Janice, Leah, and Tasia.